What are creatives and agency owners thinking right now? And how has the industry actually changed? As we come out of the pandemic, the outlook is promising. Tough, but promising. But how has the creative industry within B2B changed? And what further changes can we likely expect? So this week on the show, we're going to be looking into what it all means, as well as what you can do to maximize your job, career, or agency potential. Hello and good afternoon. My name's James Rostance and this is the 414 Live, produced exclusively for you here on LinkedIn Live. Uh, for you as a professional B2B marketer, whether you work in-house at an agency or indeed company side, or if you're an executive with a hands-on role in your B2B company's sales and marketing endeavors. So welcome along. Uh, today we've got a cool one. Uh, we had an awesome guest on last week, Tom Pepper, uh, Head of uh, M Marketing for LinkedIn UK, uh, Ireland and uh, not Iran, it was close to there. Head of UK Marketing uh, for LinkedIn uh, and he gave a really good uh, outlook as to what LinkedIn's own research has found and indeed with their new products. And I thought it'd be great to follow it on from that this week uh, as we look more into the B2B industry uh, with a focus on LinkedIn and uh, joining me to uh, give us more of a insight and, and really good detail from the front line of uh, everything. Joining us live uh, from Chester, please welcome this afternoon, Mr. Chris Branch. Chris, good afternoon. Hi, James. Great to be on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining, man. So uh, viewers and uh, listeners will, uh, will hopefully already know your name because you are indeed uh, uh, behind <laughs> all the awesome content that we see on LinkedIn from seed to branch. And uh, yes, mm. when we connected, I realized, ah, right, that's where the name comes from. It's actually your surname. <laughs> Yeah, so you specialize in uh, purely in LinkedIn content. Uh, it's uh, LinkedIn native content you describe it as, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so content that we've optimized specifically to be uploaded first to LinkedIn as the main marketing channel for its distribution. And then other social platforms can come thereafter, but really it's natively optimized for LinkedIn, yeah. Which is perfect. And uh, I love how, well, your content performs incredibly well on uh, the uh, on the platform well mm. um now the reason uh, why um, we'd uh, got you on is because uh, you are uh, very much in contact with a lot of agency creatives and also creatives within the b2b industry and mm -hmm. uh, you've got some excellent first-hand uh, frontline insights to as to what's happening right now post pandemic we'll, we'll call it post pandemic i realize it's still <laughs> going on uh, but i'm mm. I, I really like to avoid the cliches involved with coronavirus uh, so as we're now uh, coming out of it you've got some great insights for uh, what you've seen uh, happening within the industry so could i start then uh, just by asking you so what have you seen in terms of changes within the creative B2B industry? Yeah, it's been so many. Um, it's, it's been like a, a tidal wave of different things coming that I've noticed, specifically through LinkedIn. You know, um, the encouragement of LinkedIn to include this hashtag open to work banner on a lot of people's profile photos has able to make them, you know, move careers or move into uh, other fields within digital marketing uh, as well. But that's one of the, f the earliest things I noticed is that uh, a lot of people are starting to use this banner on their LinkedIn display picture to show that they are currently actively looking for work again. So they may have been put on furlough and then um, come back and then uh, unfortunately have to go through some sort of redundancy. And so there's a lot of people swapping career paths at the moment and going to and from digital. Um, there's different elements of digital that are seeing spikes compared to other spaces that are seeing dips um yeah but there's certainly loads of little things that i've just noticed going on uh with people going to and from digital at the moment so what do you see as being uh the changes you know um in terms of i mean i've seen it too with various people uh having left agencies 
is there mm. a trend or, of maybe the type of people uh, now looking for work or uh, starting out on their own? Uh, are, are there any, um, yeah, are there any trends or? Uh, um, what's the word? Yeah, trends. Yeah, well, Let's try that. Yeah, there's definitely um, uh, there's been a swing in trends. Uh, Whereas before, when you were an agency owner, you were described uh, as, well, it wasn't that you were described as that, you know, all of the advice going into myself being an agency owner was that you should specialize in a particular industry or niche, because then you get really well known for this area. And then you can quickly spread your marketing to people that are relevant. And you're always talking about relevant subjects with case studies and stuff like this. But it's turned out that many of these agency owners that did uh, specialize in hospitality or travel or one of the industries most uh, affected by the current pandemic, then these are the ones that are seeing massive hits in their marketing budgets from clients. And the diversification of your client portfolio is a real advantage to um, many of the agency owners that I know right now, especially. So I'm thinking that in the next coming years, people will start to purposefully diversify their business model for their agency a bit more than having it very niche down and specialist in a particular area, just so that the risk factor is not so much if something like this ever occurred again. And, you know, God forbid it ever does. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think people are now in that mindset where they're like, well, this is where I lost a lot of my potential business and audience because I had one particular industry in mind, whereas others that I've noticed around me haven't been so nearly as affected by something whereby their, their business model is, is a diverse palette of uh, brands from all around the world or all, all different industries. I think that's a really good point, actually. In, in fact, it's nice for you to articulate that because I, I guess um, prior to this, it, it, we've probably all known this, that uh, some people have been very lucky, some people not so. And it's because I guess that, well, no one ever considered this, right? So, um, right. which, well, which have you found to be the, the most hard hit industry sectors uh, within B2B? <sighs> yeah, this is really tough, isn't it? Like commercial hospitality is very much struggling right now. Um, they do go in waves though that I've noticed um, like travel as well uh, is obviously a really badly affected one. Um, I mean, you could list them and, and the pros and cons as to what, what's going on in those industries right now are, are, are multifaceted when you think about it. Because if there's a massive gap in one industry, then the cost per click on a pay-per-click advert campaign when there's far less competition might be a lot lower. So then it might be your time to shine and uh, where there's less of your competition around, then you may want to put yourself forward a bit more knowing that your cost per click will be lower because there's less competition. So there's all sorts of waves going on in different industries um, that I've noticed anyway. We've got a diverse portfolio of clients in all sorts of different sectors. And so I've noticed that some of their competitors are doing a lot right now and some of them have completely ground it to a halt it depends on the circumstance even by company this is what's particularly interesting is even the industry isn't a tell like i've seen companies in the same industry doing the polar opposite things even though they have the same headcount of staff roughly the same company turnover it's just um it's solely down to that brand and what their decisions are rather than the industry playing too much part in whether they can or cannot participate in marketing. With you, with you. Okay, so is there a, uh, what, what could we do? I'm having a bad Friday for actually getting my words out. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. <laughs> right, focus, James. Okay, um, so given what we've learned from this, uh, what would be a good way of um, adjusting for now and then going forward in the future? Yeah, so I think uh, ignore the old advice of going down to specialize in a particular industry or niche. Uh, try to diversify your portfolio a little bit more. This is really future proofing, though. You know, if you do mm. want to make a name for yourself quickly, you can do that a lot easier within a small subsector. So perhaps try to diversify out from that point with on. Once you've made a name for yourself in a particular industry, continue to diversify that portfolio. Um, I mean, the other side of the coin is that I've previously known agencies to be casting the net too wide, 
whereby they're willing to work with anyone and have no specialist subject knowledge in that industry whatsoever. So there's definitely like a fine balance uh, between picking a diverse portfolio of clients and industries versus trying to work with everyone in every industry. Um, so yeah, there's that you need to just understand where your strengths lie and where you can pot where you potentially think that you can uh, expand to and mm -hmm. how you could do that. And um, I mean, even if it means taking on a client uh, a slightly reduced fees in order to get a case study portfolio to break into a new industry, think of like uh, onboarding tactics into new industries and new clients that way. That's a nice um, tip, if you will. Uh, the idea of deliberately, not deliberately, um, tactically, that's a better word. Uh, tactically yeah, choosing tactically, yeah. A, yeah, another industry so that you've then got um, almost like a backup plan in a way, but one that you can build from yeah. that. Is that a good way of describing it? Yeah, exactly. And you don't know how uh, things are going to take off in that in new industry that you're in. You know, it may be that you get a really great client portfolio going very early on that someone trusts you because of previous work in previous industries. And then you could just you get a real kickstart into a new industry. So I, I like to call it the shotgun effect where you're, you're putting sort of things out there <laughs> and you're understanding which one resonates. And then you're just capitalizing on the resonation. No. With that idea then, would this work as well for agencies, but also individual uh, creatives? Yes, definitely. I think from an individual perspective, for, especially from the people that I speak to anyway, um, they want to be known for a certain thing. Like if you're a d designer for beer cans, for example, then you sort of get this portfolio around being beer cans and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, I think purposefully up, upgrading your portfolio into things that you're not particularly um, comfortable with at first, but that you can grow into comfortability. So it's, it's about understanding where you think you might be comfortable in the future as opposed to where you think you might be comfortable instantaneously. Um, certainly that's the way that I've uh, expanded my agency model. And uh, it was forcing myself to be in scenarios whereby I think, well, that's going to be a tough brief to work with but i think we could still make it work as long as i have hope for it and i have the ability to be able to you know pull across things that we've learned from other industries i mean we specialize in linkedin so it kind of helps that we know the platform so that's a really uh an interesting thing to think about as well like most agencies they work on most platforms with most industries mm. so that's an agency issue is that they're trying to cover off too many things so i don't want it to be confused here that i'm thinking you know try and do everything all at once because that's a bit of the gary v model is, is try and be everywhere for everyone at all times mm -hmm. i i think it's better to not spread yourself so thin but also have a diverse diverse portfolio at the same time is it, it sounds counterintuitive almost to say it but you need to have some uh broader horizons than just the industry that you want to work in I get it. What I'm picking up from what you've just said there is, uh, and I like the contrast between um, sort of uh, Gary V's. Um, does, well, I guess with uh, Gary V, he probably has a, a drive to be super impressive. And a lot of the times, mm. uh, would you agree, would you agree with this, that things that are super impressive um, don't necessarily work or aren't as practical as something like what you're suggesting there of being a bit more conservative mm. in trying new things. It's not as sexy, but I imagine it's you're more likely to succeed it is as, as you said, if you try things one at a time or in, in small batches. That's it. It's the micro chunking of it all. It's, it's not trying to put yourself out there at all platforms at all times because you can't specialize in all of them straight away. You have to sort of take those baby steps. And although, you know, you want to be there and you can see people like Gary Vee doing it is you many people don't understand how much of a team he has behind him in Vayner Media mm. and the capacity he has to be able to get things everywhere at all times because he has a literally a network and a team of people helping him and assisting him whereas if you're a smaller agency trying to replicate gary v's model you'd be very much struggling to tr to try and do the sort of stuff that he does uh, do, you, do you happen to know uh, or can he uh, or 
Crikey, well, I'll try again. Do you happen to know uh, how big his team? Can you give us an, an idea of that and, and what sort of people uh, he's got I, involved? That's a really good question. I, you know, I only know from friends that he has mm-hmm. a London and a New York base and, and VaynerMedia is is multi-international company, you know. And um, they have a team around Gary at all times supporting him with content. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I don't know how much he talks about this, uh, but... Certainly, like I've seen a lot of his videos and his PDFs have been produced by his team and then transposed onto other platforms like Instagram and TikTok even now. And, and he, he, he actually was one of the first people to talk about how the power of LinkedIn organic is the place to be, especially if you're in the B2B marketplace. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, he has some really great advice for people in terms of, telling them the platforms they should be on, telling them the content types that they should be producing, telling them the frequency of content that they should be making. I just feel like um, just being on all platforms at all time and it is, it's too hard for most people. He says that most people should treat themselves like a media agency. So whether you're a brand who's not a media agency, you should treat yourselves as a media agency in order to get your marketing out there. I just don't know that all brands have the capability of doing something like that. I think just small pieces at a time, getting to master a platform, understanding an audience and truly using that data to refine your content choices over time and having an informed choice to your content as opposed to it just being trying to put it everywhere in order to attract all eyeballs possible. That's a really nice uh, grounding um... A uh, bit of advice there, I would say, for that, Chris. Uh, uh, so, mm, uh, just, just hey, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, to recap on that, from what I got from that, uh, is that you're saying essentially, yes, what Gary V, and I, I realize we're not going to make this into a, a Gary V analysis show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> however, <laughs> the guy is very successful at what he does. Uh, and, and, you know, if you want to attain success, uh, model it and learn from it. So, what I got from that is uh, certainly uh, Gary V um, encourages people to to do uh, certain things, like as you um, like as you, as you said there. Uh, but I think the one thing that he misses out, and what you've now added added to it, is to not be phased or compare yourself to him and his massive organization. Yes. Uh, that's because, that's the yeah. be, that's the key. Uh, it, it, it's it's like trying to take a blue chips marketing strategy into an SME's. It just isn't going to work, you know. Like, it, and I think that people don't understand that about Gary V enough. That mm. the level that he's at as an individual taking on agencies, he can literally take on agencies as an individual. He is that front man to that band, you know, and and that's really what it's all about. Like. Um, yeah, it's just trying not to replicate exactly what he's doing and just sort of taking his advice more so, you know, because he does give out solid advice, but people want to copy him and his mm-hmm. actual strategies. That's the that's the mistake that many people are making. Yeah, and you've not got the resources to match that like Exactly. Line. And that's got to, exactly. I imagine, as well, screw with your head a bit when you can't replicate those exact results because mm-hmm. you haven't had someone say to you, dude, don't, dude, uh, dude, don't worry. Uh, you haven't got an, an 80 strong London office and one in New York. So good. All right. That's a, a, a nice touch. Uh, if I may, uh, Tim Hawkins has uh, messaged on the, uh, on the channel. Morning, t- uh, afternoon, Tim. Hi. Uh, and he asks uh, you, what channels and mediums do you expect to be impacted more and uh, vice versa? Uh, what channels and mediums do I expect uh, to be impacted to, more? I- impacted more, yes. Uh, I, get, I, I imagine he means mm. uh, with the, uh, the changes in the way that we're all working and in turn uh, customers. Yeah, that's a really good question. So... Um, in terms of digital channels, I've noticed uh, a massive shift shift in pay-per-click media. The amount of companies bidding on pay-per-click media, although we don't particularly get involved in it, actually we do organic first strategies at Cedar Branch. Mm. Um, I've, I've heard from friends you know, that there's huge shifts in, in who's bidding, when they're bidding, why they're bidding, what type of customers they're trying to bid for, whether it's short-term or medium-term types of bids that they're going for. Um, a lot of people are using this as a time to make brand awareness, like I said, cost per click is a lot lower in some industries and a lot higher in others. 
So really it's about um, understanding and forecasting what's going on right now in particular digital channels. I don't think SEO was ever being affected that much because uh, really this is, you know, SEO is sort of an ongoing long-term project that you need to do. And yes, they may have had some funding pull away from it temporarily, but that work will just continue on straight away as soon as budgets are able to be resumed, as long as it's not emergency funding only from certain brands. Um, but yeah, in terms of social media, people have had to be much more reactive to circumstances, understanding, empathetic. They've had to change much of their tone of voice uh, almost overnight, many of them. Um, and a lot of them weren't prepared for that. And so I think that we felt like the rough edge of that ironing act itself out over the last couple of months of people just not getting it right. They just don't get the tone of voice that they, a brand should have right now. And so there's been a lot of cross wires with customers and potential clients. Um, and now people are just starting to get used to the tone of voice that they need to have in this new future. But um, it's still been a very hard process for brands to adapt. I've seen very good brand collaborations with like trying to, you know, support their customers throughout this period. And I've seen very poorly organized ones and misunderstood ones, you know, where people are, for example, trying to separate their logo to show social distancing in the early part. It's like, well, how is that really helping your customers in any way? It's just showing that you can do some funny graphic design or fun, you know, like the, the McDonald's arches, they split the arches yeah, so that it was supposed to show the social distancing. Well, it, well it's how... Oh, no. No. Chris has just frozen there. Uh, that's like that new new series on um, Amazon Prime. Mm. We'll wait for a second for Chris to unfreeze. Please unfreeze, Chris. No. Uh, we were late this afternoon in going live because we were having a, a few technical problems and it looks like this technical bug has come back again. Ah, right. Um... Ladies and gentlemen, if you can bear with me, right, I'm, going to, I'm going to put up the uh, the holding graphic whilst I try and get Chris back on the line. If you don't mind, could you uh, could you wait right there, and I'll try and uh, re-establish the link with Chris uh, for the four one four live this afternoon. All right. And we're back. There we go. All right. Uh, uh, so, Chris, I can hear you on the uh, on, my, on my ears. So, uh, if this works, when I press the button, we've now set a record for the fastest reconnection uh, Great. Of, of a guest live on the show. Right. Let's try this one more time. Then, <laughs> joining us from the north of England, <laughs> Mr. Chris Brant, live from Chester. There you go. I can see you now. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Thank, uh, thank you, viewers, for hanging with us there. That was um, a record pit stop. Right. You were in the middle of um, giving quite a, quite a cool answer, but I was thrown by, uh, <laughs> by that. I believe you were answering the question from Tim Hawkins there from Run to Digital. And you, you were just um, uh, getting to the main point of uh, channels and mediums that you thought would be uh, impacted yeah, by the changes uh, of everything. 
I was giving it a bit of a roundabout answer, wasn't I? I was, uh, I, I sort of been through PPC, I've been, mm -hmm. been through SEO. Social, social is really my forte, you know. So I, that's where I've noticed the biggest change: uh, adaptability in brands and everything like that. Uh, it, it's just, it, it's very hard for many brands, you know, to incorporate what is a new thing to them and everybody uh, into their tone of voice uh, online, and it still be engaging and fun and not fear-mongering in a way. <laughs> yes. Uh, what do you see as being some of the advantages then that um, individual creatives uh, and certainly agencies have got then uh, mm. that the, that's all of this has provided us? Because there's always something that you can work to your advantage. Uh, oh, definitely. What have you noticed when speaking with uh, creatives and agencies well, they're just so much more faster to react, aren't they? This is the massive thing that I'm noting is um, the bigger your establishment, the more people have to agree to certain things to be changed. And, you, and the reactivity time, therefore, goes drastically increases. So um, individuals are able to adapt their tone of voice somewhat instantaneously because it's down to their decision. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what holds back a lot of other brands is is this how do we react when do we react you know is it too slow to react or is it too fast to react or are we nailing this are we nailing that is the board got to sign it off these are the sorts of stumbling blocks that a lot of people come across whereas individuals can be very reactive and personable tomorrow if they wanted to you know, it's, it's, that's just the fundamental way that uh, it works as far as I've noticed is the bigger your establishment, the more time it takes to be able to click that yes button. And actually put it into effect. I'm with you. Yes, exactly. And then, you, you know, you may have more hands to be able to carry that out once it is there, but you are certainly slower at carrying it out than an individual. So uh, oh, I should at this point as well... Um, say to the audience so if there's something you'd like to um put to chris and and ask then please do put it in the uh, comments section um i would love to guarantee we won't drop off the air again um <laughs> but um <laughs> i'd like to think we've, we've got it sorted so so long as we stay on the air uh what would you like to ask chris uh, to put to him and we will provide expert clarification and uh, and um uh, optimistic insight <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, the other thing, uh, Chris, that, that I wanted uh, to ask you is, mm. uh, with regard to predictions, uh, what do you predict as uh, being some noticeable or maybe some unexpected uh, changes that you see happening in the future? Mm. Well, I think one of the most predictable things like, would be that we're going to see a massive shift towards digital as a whole in general. Um, it's a, over the last five or 10 years I've been working inside agencies, I've noticed more and more of my friends that weren't involved in digital showing interest in getting into digital marketing in general because they see it as a lucrative career online, one where, the, the one where they could work from home, and this is obviously post having to work from home or pre having to work from home, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, but, so I saw a swing then, but now I feel like there's so many industries that were affected on the high street and uh, hospitalities and, tra and travel industries specifically that I feel like we're going to see much more people starting up micro agencies. So taking the impetus into their own hands and starting up their own little agency like I have done um, and, and going down that path just to see how far it can take them really. Like that's where I, that's the most predictable thing I can see in the next coming few years is that we're going to see a massive trend in people moving towards digital because it is um, pandemic proof. I guess people are going to start calling job roles these days. But um, yeah, so other than that, though, it's very hard to predict what's actually going to happen in the next 24 months, isn't it? I mean, look at the last six months. I'm not sure many people could have predicted what happened. So mm -hmm. thinking in the future, it's very difficult to judge it. I wonder how this might affect then uh, education, you know, with all the mm. courses at universities. Have, have you got any thoughts on that as to what might Definitely. need? Yeah, what might what might need to be changed with university courses? 
Well, actually, we have a client that does higher education resources, and they are a data-based company. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've noticed that there's going to be a massive shift towards data. And this is through their own insights that they've been able to give us white papers from um, that I've actually read through, you know, uh, as well as helping them design it from a marketing perspective. I've actually read through lots of the research that they've been doing with higher education. Uh, they even uh, interviewed UCAS, uh, which are pretty much the main governing body hmm. to understand like the connection that they're going to have i mean one of the big one, one of the most interesting facts that i saw of their webinar was that one in five pupils are going to be questioning going to university this year because wow yeah which is a huge jump in you know so so really if there's no alternative for them and if there's no safeguarding and, and them feeling like they're safe inside a university campus then they're going to be losing one fifth of the amount of people applied to university in the UK this year, which is huge. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the shift in digital education is going to be massive. I, I was already, you know, I was a lecturer before I was a marketer and we were able to host online webinars so people were able to tune in from home. There's going to be a massive shift towards that. Um, but having that one-to-one -one time as well on a roster is going to have to be super important too. Like having that actual physical connection and meeting them is just, it's just going to have to be very well managed and occupancy levels are going to have to be very uh, well understood through data. Yes, you give me an idea there actually. So uh, based on what you mentioned earlier uh, about how uh, creatives are, uh, a lot of them are going their own way and starting up their own micro agencies, mm. Could that also then be the case with uh, with regard to education then? Uh, so uh, a shift towards uh, more heavily uh, micro educators, I, I, I guess, uh, to take... Almost certainly. Right. And I guess given what you've said there as well, if that is what a fifth of students are... Um, how did you put it? Are they, they're considering or... They're yeah, they're, they're reconsidering their university application for this year. Um, right. So it, it, in a so this was something that they put out as a survey uh, amongst all people that have applied to universities that one fifth are now questioning whether that was the right decision or whether they should withdraw their application due to the circumstances um, because universities uh, historically are very slow to react to anything technologically. Yes. Um, so that you know, I think people of millennial level or age group. Uh, they're much more technologically savvy and will understand that, that this may be not the right time to be going to university because now we have triple fees, you know, like this is the other thing. Um, it, it's, it's not really? cheap for them to go, is it? You know, like 9,000, 10,000 pounds a year, whatever it costs them. Um, if there's no guarantee of the safety and everything of them being at university, then a lot of people will be reconsidering that. So, yeah, I can see the micro... Uh, lecturer being a very big thing in the near future especially one that can be digitally savvy and uh you know doing on online tutoring or online lecturing uh it's going to be really interesting and i hope universities do adapt because i am quite fond of the university setting and i don't want to see them just you know crumble into nothing after this like um but Certainly, if they don't keep up with the digital revolution, they're going to lose a large portion of their audience, which is quite worrying. Yeah. Well, competition is always good, isn't it? And uh, it, it, it inspires and, and, and provides uh, mm. reinvention and creation. Uh, mm -hmm. So, okay, okay. I've got to say um, hello this afternoon to uh, to uh, Rod o Rod Oliveira uh, and uh, it was Martin. Uh, who is it? Martin Perry, of course. Yeah. Hello, Martin. Uh, both uh, watching and giving you a, th a solid thumbs up there, uh, Chris. Oh, great. <laughs> well, you know what? Um, what would be cool right now then is could um, could I ask you to uh, summarize what you would like uh, people to take away from what you've noticed firsthand in speaking with mm. uh, agency owners and creatives uh, for what what's uh, what's going on right now and uh, and what the future holds what would you like the mm. key takeaways to be my key takeaways would be uh question question every previously known knowledge source you had about opening up an agency and whether or not in the new future it's still actually relevant so like i said before um previously i was advised to specialize in one particular industry niche down and focus this is how to grow a fast 
client base. And uh, that, although may be the case to be, still get some fast traction, is not helping you with your risk reward agency model. You need to have a naturally diversified portfolio of clients. And even if that is hard for you to think about, like if you're just a sports marketer and all you ever want to do is deal with sports, then think about fitness and nutrition as being a separate subsector of that, which is potentially not going to be affected by, you know, you're basically trying to future proof your, uh, your business. Um, so yeah, that's the basic advice I would, uh, and, and the same goes with all general social media stats, you know, mm -hmm. um, always question everything and whether or not it applies to you as an individual. Uh, one of the most frustrating things I see on LinkedIn, um, is people telling people when the right times to post are. And it's like, well, <laughs> do you understand my network? Because if you don't, then you don't understand when the best times to post are because everybody has a different individual time. If, so but I see generalized stats being bandied around by people and they think they're giving out generally good advice, whereas actually that could be quite harmful. If people always think that Tuesday between 9 and 11 is the best time for them to be posting on LinkedIn, for example, that's all they'll end up doing and then they'll miss out all the other opportunities to attract network people that might be online at a different time. So just question all advice um, that you're given and try and put it into context of 2020 is the best way that I'd say to future-proof. Don't go with the old advice anymore. It's not necessarily accurate. That's very wise words. And I like that as well. Uh, particularly uh, your idea of um, diversifying uh, in, in areas relative to your own so that you can leverage your existing expertise. Uh, That's right, yeah. So, so just going as a subsector is something else. Yes. It, it, it's, the, this is where I think people, they, they automatically hear like a diversify and they start grating against that, you know, whereas if they realize that it actually could be something quite related to, but just fundamentally slightly different, then they'd start to think, okay, well, these are potential br bridges and pathways that I could build. To uh, move forward. And I guess it's also uh, worth uh, recapping you, you're the excellent point, And I'm a fan of this. Uh, and how did, could you describe it one more time? The idea of, um, deliberately going out and uh, doing a piece of work in something unrelated to what you were doing just mm. so that you um it was your shotgun analogy wasn't it yeah it's it's, it's um i mean i i've always described it to uh friends that i work with who are trying to start a similar agency to my own as being you just want to test the waters and see what you're capable of and what uh, the feedback from the client is and so yeah putting yourself in an unfamiliar circumstance that you think that you could do quite well in i'm not saying to just completely jump in the deep end of a swimming pool without knowing how to swim mm -hmm. i'm saying you know instead of starting with uh you know your training wheels essentially uh you could start to just go into another industry and see and, and working with the flow just going with the flow you know just really understanding what you could bring as value that you could transpose from your previous knowledge of previous industries and previous marketing experience, what you could bring in that would be of best value to these people, um, and just going with it instead of having your guard up instantly and, and then you know, trying to back out at every possible opportunity, just naturally just saying, okay, well, this I feel like I'm comfortable with, this I feel like I could do, and just building up block by block until you feel like you're really starting to make headway into a new industry and just naturally diversifying your portfolio of clients because that will give you uh, more security in the future. Yeah. This happened again, right. Saying that, exactly. Um, and this is, you know, let's hope that this never happens again and that we never have to go through this. But I mean, it's, it's been the warning signs for so many people that this is something that now I need to take very seriously in terms of diversing, d diversifying who they work with. Because if you were a marketing agency that only dealt with the travel industry, you lost a lot of your clients uh, recently, um, no matter how good you were, because their clients just mm. stopped spending marketing budget because they just weren't able to fulfill holidays. Um, so yeah, th that's where I feel like um, I've, I naturally stumbled into it because I had an inbound strategy to my agency whereby people contacted me and I wasn't reaching out to one particular industry. I put a lot of content out in front of people and then the, the natural diversification of the inbound content marketing model helped me without me knowing it. 
Um, whereas many other agencies have an outbound model and they are only outbounding to one particular industry. But with you, with you. Uh, Chris, that really has uh, been, uh, been cool. And um, uh, well, very much. Thank you uh, for, for sharing that. And thank you for thank joining you. the show today. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. It was really great to be here. And hopefully uh, we'll do it again sometime and not have technical issues and uh, <laughs> all of those things. But no, it's great. Thank you very much. That, uh, that I very much hope. And yes, uh, I believe as of next week, we'll have new software for running the show. So boom shakalaka. Hopefully no more technical <laughs> problems. All right. Chris Branch, live from Chester. Thank you so much. All Cheers. Right. See you guys. Bye. And uh, hopefully you've got uh, uh, value from that. And yeah, I, I very much uh, do, particularly with this week's episode, because uh, there's, there are, everything has changed, as, as we know. But I really want uh, you to be able to uh, take some inspiration from that, uh, whether you work in an agency or indeed if you're an individual uh, creative, uh, whether you're looking to set out on your own now because your situation's changed, or if you want to uh, rise to the challenge of making good of uh, the way the, um, the world has changed and, and with that, our, our industry. So there we go. Well, look, uh, this is produced every week for you as a B2B marketer, in-house and agency, and as an executive involved in your company's sales and marketing. And every week, I speak with some of the greatest and most interesting minds in B2B marketing so that you can directly enhance and improve your professional knowledge every week. And I hope uh, uh, you'll join me here same time again next week for the 414 Live. Yeah, you can go, come in. It's cool. <laughs> I'm just, just finished. <laughs> Thanks, man. Good. Oh, I'm, I'm just finishing now. It's, 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 um, it's 30 seconds. Time.